Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the Santa Cruz County ACES Network of Care Learning Session on Building Community Resilience, What's in Our Soil. I'm Nicole Young and I'm going to be one of your co-hosts for today. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep us moving and, and give a little bit of context about what it is we're here to do today um, and kind of provide some context and background about what we've been discussing and learning about in the last few sessions as a way of explaining what we're going to do today. Um, so today's ACES Network of Care Learning Session is part of a series that First by Santa Cruz County has been hosting with the support of the core investments team. So that includes me and my colleague, Nicole Lezen, um, and our team members, Nikki Bailey and Gisela Carrasco. And these sessions <clears throat> have been planned in partnership with Santa Cruz County's public health departments, the Family and Children's Services Division, which is part of the Human Services Department, the Health Improvement Partnership, or HIP. Uh, and this session in particular, um, very grateful for the partnership from Encompass Community Services and Live Oak Cradle to Career. You'll hear more about their role in just a little while. And uh, we have an amazing group of Santa Cruz County parent leaders that are joining us today as our featured guests. Uh, we have Viviana Rocha, Diana Valadez, Zef Santana, and Yvette Magana. Um, and they're going to be part of a conversation that we get to listen in on. Uh, Erendira Guerrero from Encompass Community Services and Allison Guevara, who's a social impact consultant and leads the Live Oak Cradle to Career Initiative. The two of them are going to guide that conversation. So I'll say more about them a little bit later on. But first, let me give you, again, some of the context about why, why we're here. Um, over the past several months, some of you know this, we've been busy learning about concepts and approaches and examples of how other communities are collaborating to identify, treat, heal, and prevent adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, as it's sometimes called, um, that happen within the context of adverse community environments which is also ACEs. And so we've been doing this work because California recently launched an ACEs Aware initiative led by our first ever Surgeon General, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, and Dr. Karen Mark from the Department of Healthcare Services for California. And I just wanna take a moment to define what we mean by adverse childhood experiences in case that's a new term for, for anybody. So ACEs basically are stressful or traumatic experiences that people have during childhood before they turn 18 and become an adult. And you may hear people talking about, or this may look familiar, um, talking about 10 categories of adversities in these three kind of broad areas, abuse, neglect, and household challenges. Um, and these were identified in the landmark study that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and Kaiser Permanente did in 1998. So that's been quite a quite a while ago now. Um, and this slide that we're looking at shows common types of ACEs like physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect, and other challenges that families often face like mental illness or a family member being incarcerated or domestic violence, substance abuse, and divorce. So there are some surveys that are, that are done across the state to try to identify how often are these things happening? How, how often do they occur um, to people? And so these are some charts or some data that tell us across the whole state of California, 62% of Californians said they have experienced at least one of those 10 types of ACEs. And 16% have experienced four or more adverse childhood experiences. So that's almost one out of every five people. Um, and I do wanna say these charts are based on data that was you know, gathered between 2011 and 2017. So even the data is a little bit old at this point. At this point. And unfortunately the data from this survey um, is not available by specific counties. So we can't look at, okay, what are those numbers specifically for Santa Cruz County? But basically this tells us that adverse childhood experiences are common. Um, and they're, you know, it's actually a good thing that people are starting to talk about it more and recognize it more because that means we can do something about it. And so 
that this matters because studies have also found that the more adversity someone experiences in childhood, which is you know, a critical period of development, the higher the risk for health problems later in life, like heart disease, cancer, diabetes, substance abuse, and mental health issues. And then experiencing more ACEs even increases the risk of dying earlier. So it shortens the lifespan. And then treating these illnesses and diseases that are related to adverse childhood experiences becomes really expensive. So this slide here is, is showing that the estimated cost to treat health issues associated with those different types of adverse childhood experiences was $112.5 billion in 2013. So again, 2013 is a while ago, so that figure has probably only increased you know, or gotten higher as, as time has gone on. So that's a lot of money, right? And so Dr. Burke Harris, or Surgeon General, has set a bold goal of reducing adverse childhood experiences by 50% in one generation. That's bold. I mean, think about how long it takes for change to happen. And so across the state to reduce ACEs by 50%, that's a tremendous goal, um, but very worthwhile. So to achieve that bold goal, um, California's ACEs Aware Initiative is focusing on helping medical providers in particular understand the importance of screening for ACEs or identifying um, you know, when or, or how often they're happening and ensuring that there's a, a trauma-informed, coordinated network of care that's ready to treat and help children and families heal from the lasting effects of adversity. So when I say coordinated network of care, I want you to think of that as the web of all the resources and supports and community conditions that need to exist and be accessible to children and families in order to thrive. And so hopefully this, this graphic looks familiar to some of you. We often refer to these as the core conditions for equitable health and well-being. Um, you know, think of it as healthcare for health and wellness, education, you know, stable income, nurturing relationships and family environments, uh, connections to the community, healthy environments, um, and safety and justice and stable, affordable housing and shelter. So those are often what we refer to as the core conditions for health and well-being. And if we take that a step further and, and connect it to um, the ACEs Aware efforts in Santa Cruz County, our county's public health department has now received two grants from the statewide ACEs Aware initiative to implement activities at a local level. So first five, the Health Improvement Partnership or HIP, um, the Human Services Department, their Family and Children's Services Division, and Stanford Children's Health through their Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, we've all been collaborating, communicating over the last several months, you know, building on existing partnerships and initiatives, and, and you know, really with this goal of strengthening and integrating medical, social, and community networks of care that then create those conditions for equitable health and well-being. And those of you that have been on these, participated in these sessions in the last few months uh, will remember that First Five's role in this is to convene six network of care learning sessions. And so we've been using these sessions to promote the ACEs Aware initiative, share best practices, and strengthen the coordination and collaboration among um, network of care partners. And so today is our fourth session. And in our first three sessions, we really we learned about and we keep referring back to um, this tree, this graphic, this pair of ACEs concept that Dr. Wendy Ellis and her team at the Center for Community Resilience, or CCR, um, introduced us to. So a pair of ACEs stands for adverse childhood experiences that happen in the context of adverse community environments. So CCR uses this image of a tree to describe those 10 types of ACEs, um, the adverse childhood experiences, and think of them as like the branches and the leaves of the tree that will show visible signs of vulnerability and illness if the roots of the tree are growing in toxic soil or adverse community environments that lack equity. So by that, I mean you know, um, communities where there is concentrated poverty and discrimination and poor housing conditions, um, higher risk of violence and victimization or homelessness and a lack of economic, economic opportunity and social mobility. So that's what we mean by the pair of ACEs, um, adverse childhood experiences in adverse community environments. 
you know, and many of us are used to identifying and using data on these different types of ACEs, like substantiated child abuse rates or the number of unsheltered homeless people in our community or children living below the federal poverty level. And I just wanna give a little shout out to DataShare Santa Cruz County. That's where all these um, graphs and charts came from. It's a, a relatively new web-based platform where you can find a lot of different types of local, state and, and national data. Um, and so, you know, we use these, these kinds of data to better understand the challenges and issues that we're trying to address. You know, especially when there are disparities or differences in outcomes that are tied to race, ethnicity, age, gender identity, immigration status, or other characteristics. So this kind of community level data is valuable because it can help us frame the issues, right? Meaning that we use data to tell a story about the long-term effects of adverse childhood experiences on health and well-being. And that can help uncover or highlight issues in ways that lead to shared goals and priorities and creative solutions. But the other really important part of the narrative is how policies and practices are the systemic drivers of the inequitable outcomes or the data that we see. So it means that we have to keep digging deeper and identify structural racism as the root cause of many of those inequitable policies and practices that produce the inequitable outcomes. So then it means that we use community level data on both adverse childhood experiences and adverse community environments um, in a way that helps us look at how we need to transform policies and practices so that they produce equitable outcomes. The other thing I love about this tree is that it, it serves as a, as a metaphor and a reminder that adversity is not the only side of the story. And so the image of a healthy tree can help us think about how we work to identify and heal from adverse experiences and how we can ensure that adults are supported so that they can create healthy households for children to grow up in. It can also think, help us think about how we can cultivate connected and equitable environments and systems that lead to positive childhood experiences instead of adverse childhood experiences and that ultimately lead to community resilience. So in other words, we need to be taking care of both the branches and the leaves of the tree while also nurturing the soil and the roots. And again, tying this all back together, that means as a network of care, we must simultaneously strengthen and sustain programs and partnerships with families and agencies and community and create connected equitable systems and supports. So that requires us to work together in new and different ways, again, to, to create transformational change um, that addresses root causes of adversity and allows us to achieve racial equity and justice. So that's exactly what we focused on and learned more about in some of our other sessions with the Center for Community Resilience. Um, CCR shared strategies for using policies as a tool for change at a systems level. We got inspired by different examples of collective impact and building partnerships across sectors um, that some of the building community resilience networks in Oregon and Cincinnati shared with us. And in last month's session, CCR talked with us about the reinforcing cycle of white supremacy and how it's a public health crisis that is a form of trauma and how centering community voice is essential to equity and resilience. And they challenged us to ask ourselves, how are we showing up? What are we doing to center community? Um, which means that we have to be intentional and responsive and sit with discomfort instead of trying to maintain the status quo by being passive or reactive um, or trying to go back to what feels familiar and comfortable. And in fact, one of our guests, Von Tries, asked us during the session, you know, has anyone talked to families about, you know, and asked them what they think about ACEs screenings or really even about our ACEs Aware initiative? And, um, you know, when we thought about it afterwards, we thought, well, you know, yes, maybe some of those conversations are happening within individual organizations, but we know uh, we haven't done that intentionally or explicitly within the context of these network of care learning sessions. And so we thought it's time. Um, so that brings us to today. Today's session really is an opportunity for us to pause, to listen, to reflect on how we are showing up and how we are or will be centering community before we continue planning or taking steps to strengthen our networks of care 
that screen, treat, heal, and prevent adverse childhood experiences. So we actually want to use today to practice and model building in time for pauses and reflection, to take that time to make sure we're being values driven and intentional and responsive and sitting with discomfort and that we zoom out to take a look at things through a systems change lens, because we view all of that as part of being in action. Um, and that this is how we can work together to center community versus just creating the appearance of action and movement and change that really just ends up maintaining the status quo. Okay, so then here's our agenda for today. We're, we've actually just um, already done the welcome overview and introductions and review of the pair of ACEs. And next we're gonna hear a conversation led by Irendira and Allison around centering community voice and leadership with our parent leaders that are joining us today. And after that, we'll have some time for reflections and breakout discussions and come back for more discussion and a call to action. So we'll tell you more as we get closer to those points in the agenda about how we'll do all of that. But in the meantime, we want you to be thinking throughout all of it about how will you and your organization center community voice and leadership as we design our ACEs informed network of care? Because that will be what we discuss in terms of our call to action. And then we'll finish up with next steps in our closing. Okay, so I am so pleased to be able to introduce two powerful, powerful local leaders who are amazing thought partners and just um, have really um, you know, been committed to helping us design the best session possible today. They've really taken the lead in planning the conversation that you're about to hear with parent leaders uh, and they're gonna guide it. Um, so let me introduce them, Erendira Guerrero, is the daughter of Juana and Librado Guerrero. It ended up stands for opportunity for full potential for herself and others, committed to learning and growing in community to move forward change that creates racial equity and justice. It ended up currently serves as the director of Encompass Community Services Head Start Child and Family Development Programs. And Allison Guevara is a social impact consultant and mother of three children working to build resilient, equitable, and empowered communities where children and working families thrive. Allison co-founded and currently leads the Live Oak Cradle to Career Initiative and the Central Coast Early Childhood Advocacy Network. So Allison and, and Adenida are going to guide a conversation with four parent leaders in Santa Cruz County, Viviana Rocha, Diana Paladez, Lizeth Santana, and Yvette Magana. I am now going to stop my screen sharing and turn it over to Allison and Yvendida. I'm going to spotlight our speakers as they get settled. All right, well, it's wonderful to see all of you. Thank you so much, Nicole, for that really helpful overview and just wonderful welcome. Um, I'm really happy to be here with Yvendida and all of these really awesome moms who we're gonna have a conversation with. Hola, buenas tardes. Yo Hello. I'm going to do my part in Spanish. As Nicole said, my name is Arendira. And just like Allison, I'm very happy to be here and what we're going to share with the panel. And I feel very fortunate that we have this space here today. All right, great. So we're going to dive Bien. right in. Entonces, vamos a empezar. So I think what's helpful when I think about this pause is really coming back to what we care deeply about um, and aligning ourselves with our values and our strengths. And one of the most powerful generative questions that I think that can help us do that is to ask each other, what are our hopes and dreams for our children and for our families? And so that's where we're gonna begin this conversation. And I'd like to ask each of the parents to share your name, the number of children that you have, and then please share with us, what are your hopes and dreams for your children? And, and I'd like you to think bold. Imagine there's not, there's not barriers, there's no limitations on your hopes and dreams. You know, what does that dream look like and feel like? So I'm gonna ask um, Bibiana, could you go first, please? Yes, of course. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Viviana Rocha. I'm the executive assistant for the Community Health Trust and I'm here representing um, Head Start of Com Encompass Community Services, sorry. 
Um, I have two little girls. They're um, six and three. And my hopes and dreams for my kids is for them to be courageous, confident, and be passionate about giving back to the community. I want my girls to inspire other women to be just like this. And I'll pass it on to Yvette. Hola. Hi, good afternoon. My name's Deanna. I have two children, an eight and six year old. And my hopes and dreams would be to see uh, for my children as men having uh, a good foundation and to be helpful to other people. Thank you, Diana. How about Lisa? Hola, Hello. Good afternoon. My name's Lizette Santana. I have two daughters. She was nine months yesterday, a seven-year-old boy. My dream for my children is to uh, is to uh, implant values in these little seeds that I have. And see them come true. That is my dream. See them, see them be responsible citizens and working in their community. Thank you so much for, for all sharing that. I think Yvette is going to try to log back on just because of her internet. So we'll call, come back to Yvette, but I really appreciate hearing those really powerful dreams. Um, and I'm going to pass it to Irindira to kind of provide a little bit more context for the, the rest of our conversation. La palabra a Irindira. Thank you, Alison. While we're waiting for Yvette, I want to speak a little bit of it. Why are we creating this space today? And talk a little bit about what brought us here. A year ago, Allison and I had a conversation about una posición muy importante e interesante. We had a, a very important and interesting position when we work with parents and how nice it would be to bring par uh, parent leaders from different groups to a space, and that's happening today. Today we have leaders from different groups in the same space who are going to uh, share stories with you. But but the reason that we said we felt uh, fortunate in our programs, the, the information that the parents provide for us is invaluable. When we have the information directly from the parents, uh, it takes away a little bit of that guesswork. Of course, as providers, we're always trying to do the best that we can. And we're trying with changes in, in our services to, uh, to fulfill uh, the needs of the community. But when we hear and when we have those opportunities of hearing the community voices from the parents, we don't need to guess because we know exactly what it is that is needed. So even with the best of intentions, we can't really understand how a service or a system can affect or impact the community if we don't hear those voices. I'm going to give a small example of something that happened to me in the agency where I work. I was presenting to the parent groups, to the policy council, and I was very excited presenting the facts. And very proudly, I said, we uh, serve parents who work and more than half of the parents that uh, we serve work. And then, and they were asking me questions and they were happy about what I was presenting. One mother said to me, oh, excuse me, I have a question. And more than anything else, a comment. And I said, yes, please. And she said, I, I love this program. It offers so much to us, but I have a comment about something you said. And I said, that's fine. You just said that they, you provide services for families who work. Yes. And I repeated the facts again. And she said, the truth is, I'm, I don't agree with that, that you just said. And I said, well, please tell me why, because 
most of us who work eight hours and you don't provide services for eight hours and it took me a moment to breathe and reflect and say you know what thank you for correcting me that's right right now we don't provide eight hours and when i make that comment in the future i'm going to make sure that i say we offer these hours that support some parents but we need to do more and that happened about five or six years ago and since then it's something that i remember and as a program we've really tried to work to increase our service hours that we offer because we know that what we offer is good we know that it's important but even so that mother let us know that it wasn't necessarily fulfilling the community's needs the parents needs so that's why it's important to create a space where parents can feel confident to tell us what they need that's really nice what you're saying what you're offering but it's not necessarily uh, fulfilling what we need so then in this space as nicole said we're going to ask you to listen to listen what these mother uh, these uh, parent leaders are going to share with you and and i really like the phrase that says listen with your heart sometimes as professionals or people who work with people we want to listen in order to offer a solution uh we want to give out resources we want to listen to act and what i want to ask you is to take a few moments simply to listen with your heart listen to the stories and reflect on what um the these stories are telling us these mothers have a lot to tell um their stories are wonderful and valuable but today is just to present a small part because we also want to have a discussion uh, during the preparation we talked with all of them and they have a lot to share but they're they're going to share with you um, and i'm sure that some of you are going to want more you're going to want to hear more and i hope that that energy you you can take to the uh, breakout rooms that we're going to have so with that i'm going to start and transition the questions that we have today for the people on the panel but before that i want to give yvette the opportunity to introduce herself as everyone else did and have her tell us what are her hopes and dreams for her children morning or good afternoon now. Um, uh, my name is Yvette Magaña. I am the mother of four wonderfully amazing and uh, sometimes scary kids. Um, I am part of the Head Start Policy Council and with uh, Erendira, um, um, I have the chance to um, be part of this panel um, and give you guys, I guess, our, our input on, on everything. Gracias, Yvette. Y pues, uh, Thank you, Yvette. And in listening to you hear your hopes and dreams, that's always a moment of, it, it gives me goosebumps to hear those uh, hopes and dreams because I think they're universal. Many of the hopes and dreams of all of us that are here listening. So I'm going to go to the first question. The first question is, what are the strengths that you, your families bring in order to achieve these hopes and dreams that you just talked to us about? And whoever would like to start? I can start. Yo, yo puedo empezar. Um, Go ahead. I, oh, hold on. So, let me mute my audio. Sorry. There we go. So I feel like I set examples every day for all three of those items um, that I spoke about be, um, before. It's being confident, being courageous, and serving the community. Um, I'm being courageous by serving on different board of directors or committees throughout the community, knowing I am most likely going to be the youngest one in the room. 
I'm confident while asking questions or making statements during these meetings. And lastly, not only am I giving back by participating in these boards or committees, but also I do events like this where I could share my personal experience with others. And these opportunities for engagement and leadership development, um, they help support my goal for my children and my family. So I'm really grateful for this. And I'll pass the mic to whoever would like to go next. I'd also like to speak about my strengths, what strengthens me, and I, and I think I, like, I can identify with Viviana. I consider that these spacio spaces are wonderful to create different alternatives for our children, for them to develop, and it, they strengthen me as well. I have a year here in Santa Cruz. It was a big change for my life. But when I found these spaces where I can um, speak and find alternatives and programs that support my child's education, his health, and, and all the best that I want for them, that strengthens me a lot. My family unity, my husband's support, my parents, even at the distance, that also strengthens me a lot. They say, if you're happy there, I'm happy too. And I'm very happy. Thank you. Um, excuse me if you see that um, if I'm looking down, because I always like to write down what I'm going to say. For me, the biggest strengths are that we're together and healthy, and that helps us uh, for even stronger uh, ties with our family and the community. I've gotten very interested in sharing my voice in these spaces for the people who are afraid to do so, but we need to be brave because if we never made our voice, make our voice heard, we won't be heard. You have to be brave in order to be in one of these places because it's not easy. It, it, seems, it seems like it's easy, we look relaxed, but, but really the nerves are never gonna go away. But if you don't do that, you're never gonna be listened. And in this life, if you don't speak up, you're not listened to. So thank you, um, Diana. Um, I think I want to kind of piggyback on uh, what everybody's been saying, um, just um, showing the kids that, you know, if, if we're trying to make a difference, whether it be in their class or just in their life, personally, we have to, like Diana said, we have to speak up, we have to um, let people know what, what we need. Um, otherwise, yeah, we won't, we won't get what we need. Um, and showing them that voicing your opinion and and making yourself heard will go a long way. And um, I think the kids, they see how I try to be a part of um, the Head Start like community and try to do what I can. Um, and they, so they know when mom is like in a meeting or something, they try not to, not to interrupt or anything, but it, it it is very very powerful for them to see us trying to make a difference in our community and in the programs that we're we're currently in gracias thank you so much everybody wow what what strong amazing moms you all are and i know when i get to be around people like you it makes me feel stronger and more courageous um, and you know it, it helps us be able to show up and tell our stories and you know I did that last night at our school board meeting and I, I have to admit I shed some tears when I talked about what my family's going through you know some of the challenges right now and so I'm so happy we can start from this place of strength so that we we know that we're gonna we're gonna be okay and we're gonna hold each other 
so that we can now start to talk and open up this conversation around what is hard for our families right now. Um, and I want you to think a little bit about, you know, what, what worries you or keeps you up at night and, and what is challenging your family's well-being and in your ability to pursue those hopes and dreams. So that's our next question. Um, open it up to whoever like to start. I'll, I'll keep the trend going, I'll start. <laughs> um, something hard for me and my family is my battle with depression and anxiety. And I know a lot of people may look at me and be like, oh, she doesn't have depression or she doesn't have anxiety, but it's not the way you look. It's uh, what's inside and, um, you know, there could be good days and there could be bad days. And what has helped us is that my husband has been able to identify my bad days better now. And he supports me by making me go out for like a walk as a family or maybe doing my own self-care remedies, like, you know, maybe taking a hot shower and just kind of being by myself for the moment just to gather my thoughts and everything. So I feel like um, that has been something hard and a challenge in my family, but uh, it's something that's very normal that people have. And uh, there's this perception that it's bad, but it's really, you know, it's really not. And it's, you know, how you um, face those challenges and overcome them is what's really powerful. So I'm gonna pass it on to the next person. Um, puedo contestar? Um, I can answer. Can I answer? Yes, of course. Go ahead. The biggest challenges for me right now are that my children can't be with their, uh, their friends and they can't develop their abilities at 100%. It really stresses me out. See them not being able to smile. It, it, their mental health stresses me because of the pandemic. And, it, and trying to keep us healthy from day to day is stressful with the fear of this virus that is here today and many other uh, illnesses that are around. That stresses me a lot. It stresses me to see my child looking out the window, wanting to go outside and kick his ball, wanting to go out and run. It, he might be able to do it, but in order to keep ourselves safe, we have to be inside the house. It stresses me that that they're not developing as themselves, as strong children, as children with uh, wanting to, to live and develop. And that is a very strong stressor. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Deanna. Gracias. Maybe we could have one, one more um, response if Lisa or Yvette wants to share and we can move on to our next question. I'll, I'll go ahead and go. Um, so right now, uh, one of my main stresses is, um, like Diana was saying, um, it's, it's hard trying to help the kids um, with social distancing, um, the whole pandemic and making them understand, you know, we can't go see certain people. Yes, I'll get you something in a minute, okay? I'm hungry. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, so um, it's it's hard to make them understand, you know, it's, it's something that none of us have really gone through. Um, I remember growing up and going outside and playing. And um, right now, I mean, the kids, they have the electronics to kind of keep them busy but they still, they want to go out for a bike ride. They want to go um, to the park. Um, um, occasionally, you know, we'll take them out on a bike ride, but it's, it's the majority of the time we're having to cover our faces and make sure that, you know, we're, we're being safe. And um, it's, it's hard for us as it is, I mean, it's, it's twice as hard for them trying to understand everything that we're going through um, and just trying for them to learn how to use the computer and do all every, everything. It's, it's like they're going to college at uh, an elementary age and it's, it is, it's, it's really hard because uh, aside from being parents, 
and trying to teach them what we can. Um, it's like we just from one night to the other, we became their teachers, their teacher assistants, their tutors, everything. And so that's that's one of my main stresses right now is just trying to get them through their schooling. Thank you, Yvette. Yeah, for sure. Lisa, do you want to add a, anything uh, to, to that, just in terms of the challenges that you're facing? Pues puedo compartir, además I de can share, the besides all the difficulties that we all have with the pandemic, for me, it's been very important. How can I maintain that? that sense of identification with your roots, with your culture, and accepting that change. And it worries me so much, and that's why I'm always here. I'm also here that I found this space, but sometimes I ask myself if it's really worth it, and you have to put your heart into it and effort and time. And when I get together with moms, who also have the same idea that we're all pulling together, that really strengthens me a lot. But that also makes me lose sleep. Uh, I wake up at night and, and, and sometimes my husband will read a story to my son or I do. And then and one day he um, hit his, his hand to his forehead And I said, what's the matter? And he said, no, 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 nothing's wrong. Well, you can tell me if you want to. He said that I spoke uh, rudely to some kids who spoke English and they didn't want to play with me anymore. So like those, uh, those are like spaces, how we can strengthen these areas, how we can comment. Maybe you can't do it with other kids at that moment but he has that for being who you are you're worth a lot those have been my difficulties and the things that take uh to keep me from sleeping thank you lisa i think you're really touching on that community environment that our kids are growing up in um really appreciate everyone's open sharing and giving us a little insight into your lives. I know a lot of us are experiencing similar things and it feels uh, great. It feels good to be able to connect. Irindira, do you want to move on to the next question? So I'm going to ask the following question. The following question is focused on what are some of the social services, uh, some examples that you might have of the systems that are or are not help uh, supporting your needs? So for me, um, I believe Head Start is a great example of supporting parents to be courageous, confident, and give back to the community with their policy council. So the policy council is a committee of parents that ensure the Head Start program is providing the best services to children and families. With COVID-19, some centers um, were not open, but they were still able to engage my youngest to participate in activities uh, with her teacher. Another great resource um, that I think many of us can attest to is um, Second Harvest Food Bank. Um, they're, they're someone that helps close the gap in, in, the, communi in the community for food and security. Um, they provide food banks and food pantries at different locations throughout Santa Cruz County. And I'm very grateful for both these services um, that they provide for my, me and my family. And I'll pass the mic to whoever's next. Um, ¿Puedo seguir? Claro que sí, Diana. Uh, okay. Yes, of course, Diana, go ahead. I'm, I'm going to speak a little bit more about health. Up to now, for me, they have helped me personally, the clinic, uh, the East Cliff Cl Clinic in Santa Cruz. It has been a service that has uh, helped me to try and reach my dreams. I'm going to talk a little bit about my, his my history, my story. I almost always, when I, when I talk about this, it's hard for me. 
but that gives me the strength to go on and uh, make my voice heard for myself and my children. Four years ago, I was diagnosed with mastitis in the right breast, a situation that was very painful, stressful, and sad. And so up to today, I, I continue suffering with that um, problem. But the staff at the East Cliff Clinic helped me so much to connect me to Medicruz so that I could see a specialist. And today, my health is improving, not at 100%, but, but it is. I'm still in treatment and with taking medication, but I was able to see a specialist. That is, uh, and it's difficult to be able to get to that step. Also, today, they've um, given us the COVID vaccine. That's also very important since as we know it, it all goes in phases and and we were fortunate enough to be able to get it before it would have been our turn i repeat personally they have helped me but that doesn't mean that even so there are people who need help and we need to know that the resources exist you just need to look for them thank you Yvette or Lisette? Yvette? Yvette or Lisette? Um, I'll go next. Um, so I'd have to say that um, in regards to health health services as well, um, I think I've been helped quite a bit. Um, I see a, a therapist once a week um, and I'm able to kind of release some of the stress that I that I have throughout the week um, and talk about my stresses, um, talk about the kids, talk about what I'm going through personally. And it does it does help because it gives you somebody to talk to. Um, and it's a it's a professional which the you know they give you their professional opinions on certain certain things, certain topics. Um, and so I'd have to say just like Diana did, I mean, the, the resources are out there. It's just we need to find them. And depending on what it is that we're looking for and what we need or what our kids need, um, it, we can always, you know, ask and we will find out what, you know, what we're looking for. We'll find what we're looking for. Gracias, Yvette. ¿Te gustaría compartir algo, Lisette? For me, finding the health services, I haven't had the confidence. And it's just now that Cradle to Career is uh, giving us a course on how to be a promotora. The truth is, I feel more confident. I really liked a lot. I wanted to share when I had my baby. It was very difficult for me to get therapy. I didn't have the confidence to look for it or know how. And it was easier for me to call to call home and find a contact over there when I had it right here. And I'm very happy with all the services uh, that we've received so far. And I would love to participate more, in, uh, people to participate in, in these spaces so they don't struggle so much and can find the services that they need. So, este, gracias por lo que acaban de compartir. so thank you for what you just shared. As I said before, what you have to share is very valuable for us, for those of us who are listening. And before continuing with the questions that we have 
<laughs> that are more focused on ACEs and how you see or what are your thoughts about how we can implement in the community. I just want to give a synthesis of what you all talked about. Uh, Nicole presented the tree at first, right? The tree with the roots. And many of the things that you've talked about um, speak about the tree that has the leaves and the roots with changes. And, and that's what's so impressive of what you're talking about, that transformation between the tree and one um, that has its roots and things that are traumatic and and um, not supportive. And then the change to the tree in your role, uh, you're all as leaders working to have um, trees that are healthy with roots and can flower. So, so that's why we started out asking, what are your hopes and dreams? Because that's what motivates, motivates us to keep moving forward, as Diana said. So now we're going to continue with the uh, the more specific questions, more specific to ACEs, and then I'm going to give the mic to Alex. Thank you. And I, I want to say, I see Elaine's suggestion in the chat to just share a little bit more about what's not working in the health and social service system. What are some experiences that our parents have seen? And I just want to invite uh, our parent panelists to, to um, share more if you're comfortable and you want in the chat. And also any of you participants, if you want to sort of maybe share some of your experiences, if you feel comfortable doing so, I invite you to do that just to get a little bit more sense of like what what's working um, and maybe where are things not not helping us or, or um, working for us very well. Um, so to, to really shift into this conversation, you know, it would be very easy for us to be learning all about ACEs and how important it is that we screen and we, we treat and, you know, um, and just sort of jump into like, let's do ACEs screenings and let's, you know, let's, let's do this action planning. And what we really knew was important is before we get too far along that we really hear get get feedback from patients from parents around like how can we do that in a really effective and healing way and you know so we we talked a little bit about well we know that if doctors or healthcare providers can help identify past childhood traumas and work with work with um, folks to treat them that that might help alleviate you know challenges down the line um, and so that might mean that in a screening and a health visit, a, a doctor or a provider might ask a patient, you know, very personal questions about their history. Um, and the question for our parents and thinking about the ACEs screening in particular is, you know, how do you feel about doctors and other providers asking you about your personal experiences and, and history? And, and what would make that a, a healing experience? So um, personally, for uh, myself, I do not feel comfortable talking to physicians or um, therapists about my past traumas. Um, I've had, you know, sessions and I just didn't feel like a connection or that trust to really be like, oh yeah, let me just let it all out with this person. I felt like, um, I don't know if it's because they were more so trying to like do their expertise rather than like really listen to me. So I, I felt, I feel like I have grown more facing what caused my trauma as a young child and I'm healing by being more open to talking about it with, you know, with you guys, with strangers, because I feel like there isn't that, you know, like that expertise there where they're trying to just fix me instead of just letting me talk and listen to me. Um, so I think physicians or therapists need to really work on building a connection with their patients and not just treat them like another dollar sign because that's really what I felt when I was there. And uh, physicians can make connections with patients by treating visits more like a conversation and maybe be empathetic or try to relate something um, to the patient, you know, to their personal life. And I believe that that's the best way to build a connection and build trust. And then maybe, uh, you know, patients will be more open to, you know, sharing their past traumas and, um, you know, seeking help in that way. But I feel like when it just kind of gets portrayed that way, it's kind of like you just shut down and you don't want to say anything. 
and I'll right. um, pass the mic to somebody else. Thank you, Bibiana. Who would like to share next about what would make that a healing experience? How do you feel about that? Diana? Uh, experiencia de sanar. Diana? Yo, uh, I, I have a different opinion. I would think perfect, it would be perfect that doctors or counselors or providers ask, um, ask the person about their past traumatic experiences obviously it's still being respectful so that they went that way they can help to refer you to someone else so that the patients can have a quality of life it's important that when they fill out this questionnaire that they do it in the person preferred language i can tell you a little bit about the experience i had as i as i mentioned i've had this mastitis for four years and when i had my very first appointment with the doctor Obviously, I asked for an interpreter because my language is Spanish. And then when I see that the doctor comes in and then a male comes in, a young man comes in to interpret, um, I maybe feel really bad, uh, but I was in so much pain at that moment that I didn't care about the embarrassment. And so I wanted to tell her everything that I was feeling, everything that was happening to me, and the and then the moment came for the, the doctor had to examine me and then I had to undress for her to do that. And he was there. He was there interpreting every word that I was saying. And that was very uh, embarrassing for me, very uncomfortable. But most of all, um, I wanted them to take that pain away. So um, Yes, I wanted to point out that it does need to be done in the preferred language. It's very important. There are so many people, so even though they live have lived here for a long time, even so, we don't speak the language correctly. And so for me, personally, I would like it to be that way, that process. Also, something else. Uh, I do, I was grateful to the young man because he was doing his job as an interpreter, but at the same time, we were uncomfortable. I want to emphasize that, that there are people who, in situations, uh, in medical situations that are more severe, and if someone has an experience like I had, they might have come back. So it's important to point that out. And also so people can feel comfortable. It's, it seems would seem to me important to, to have that questionnaire done. I think the same thing as Diana, I agree to do it. It's important to recognize our traumas but it's not just a question of recognizing or identifying it. I would like them to take action once they recognize it because it happened to me that during my pregnancy, I, I also suffered from depression. And the only thing they told me was to go out for a walk, but I needed more than that. And, and that also set me back. Uh, and as you see, I'm having trouble controlling my emotions. And then that, uh, led me to look for support. So I think it's um, that connection and that follow-up is important once they identify it, th whatever the patient's problem is. And that's all. Thank you. Yvette, would you like to add anything? Um, I think kind of uh, Agreeing with uh, what Bibiana was saying, where like the, the doctors, they speak to you and not at you, um, because I have had some experiences where, you know, the doctors are, are talking at you. It kind of feels like you're being scolded in a way, um, rather than them being kind of more empathetic to your situations and whatnot, and, um, and them just kind of understanding, you know, your you're not perfect, you're going through a situation, you know, and you're just there to get the help that you're looking for. Um, so I would have to say, 
yeah, for them to to talk to you and not at you and and just have that that sympathy towards towards whatever it is that you're going in for and for the help that you're looking for. Thank you so much. So, um, so I'm going to do the last question, which is number six, and that has to do with the roots. Number five, excuse me. It's about the roots of ACES with the um, with the knowledge that we now have about um, the, the roots being um, in in racism. How how do you see a system or policies that could be more um, nurturing and fit and equitable? Because even if I make just one connection with a little girl who has been through um, similar situations, that's one girl I inspired. This one person that I can help and build a brighter future, the root causes are parents not being engaged in, the, in their child's life and having to trust individuals sh um, who should have not been trusted in the first place. Parents need more funding for the programs like Girls Inc. so they can have the support with their little girls. Also, more spaces should be created throughout the county to support parents in this. The conversation starts at a young age so they can be more knowledgeable as they grow. Thank you. Um, I think okay. uh, that... Yeah. No, adelante, adelante. <laughs> Um, so I think that, yeah, as long as we're, we're teaching our kids, um, at a young age, you know, that for me, um, I think, especially because the kids are watching the news as we're watching the news a lot of the times and they're asking questions, you know, about, um, cause I know my kids were asking about the whole George Floyd situation. And so I tried my best to explain, um, to them without any graphic details or anything like that. And, you know, and just telling them, you know, there's just some people that were raised different than what we were and just trying to remind them that, you know, everybody is the same. You were all different skin colors, different um, backgrounds, different languages, um, but we all deserve the same equality and to be treated with respect and not to be treated as anything other than that. Diana? Diana? Okay. Okay. I would love the medical system were accessible equally for everyone. It makes me sad to see that people need to be in poverty complete uh, to be able to get medical service. It's important to continue the confidentiality between doctor and patient and patients to social services that there could be a quick access to specialists. I had, uh, I was very fortunate and to uh, get in with one personally, but other people don't have that same good fortune. And when people cannot connect with a specialist or doctor, uh, that the uh, fees could be more affordable. My question now, talking about ACEs, how, how, do you think that there can be more access to uh, doctors and social services? Um, oops. Thank you. I think what you've offered us is invaluable. Uh, now I want to provide a space. Um, one um, request that you have to close out your participation in the panel. One request that you have for the people who are listening to us today. Viviana, do you wanna start? Yes. So one thing I wanna leave you all with is that we all can play a part in supporting parents like myself by getting involved in programs or assisting in funding programs to ensure families have the support they need when they need it most. 
Um, I appreciate um, you for giving me the time and I hope you all have a blessed day. Diana, tu pedido al grupo. Diana, what is your request for the group? I would, I think that I would like to ask, as the word says, that, that there be more spaces like this one so that we can say what our needs are. So it doesn't just stay with, with the need, that there's an answer for the community. And perhaps that they might allow that Cradle Career is more involved in these spaces and systems since uh, Cradle to Career is composed of parents in the community and every parent has their own challenges and needs and together we can create solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Lisette, what is your request? My request, the same, to create more spaces where parents can speak and ex uh, express their needs. I, I agree with that. That's where the roots are. We can't study the problem or they can't study the problem in other places when the needs are right here, right now, in this moment. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I'd have to piggyback off of what are the other, all the other ladies said. Um, we do need more spaces where, where we can voice our opinions and be heard. Um, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> Quiero pedir un aplauso para este grupo. I want to ask for applause for a group of uh, panelists who have provided something invaluable to us. And I, and I hope it has been that way for all of you as well. <laughs> Our um, gratitude is to all of you for have, being so brave of the, having the perseverance to, per, to participate today. And I know that if this isn't going to be the last time that, to be in a group like this where we ask for your opinions. And now I will um, give the word to Allison. The, um, Allison. Oh, well, thank you. I, I you, you guys said it all. I'm so inspired. Um, and you have so much insight. And I know that the more that we can tap into that and that we center that wisdom in how we plan our healthcare and social service um, systems, the, the better those are going to be. And so I, I, I know we're going to transition now to have that conversation in our breakout groups. Um, and so I think Nicole is going to help us set that up. But I just wanted to take a quick screenshot of our amazing panelists um, before we do that, just so that it, while we give them all a virtual applause, we'll just take a big picture of them so that we have this to celebrate. Thank you. All right, Nicole, I pass it back to you. Got it. Okay. So we are going to um, turn this back to gallery view for a moment. And I'm seeing a lot of appreciation being expressed in the chat and uh, with clapping hand emojis So and hearts. So lots of deep, deep appreciation um, and respect for, for all of you, Viviana, Lisa. Um, Diana and Yvette for again sharing with us today. And so what we'd like to do before we send everyone um, to breakouts is give you a chance to just share some of your first kind of reflections um, about what you heard from parents in terms of the, our four parents that shared with us today about um, what they shared as the, as the leaves and branches as well as the roots and the soil. Um, and so Nicole Lezen has posted a link in the chat to a Padlet, which is basically a, a website. And so I'm gonna share my screen for just a moment so you can see it, but feel free to click on that link so you can see it as well. Um, and so this, when you click on that link, it should open up a website, again, in your own web browser. Once you're there, we want you to think about this question and, and answer it uh, in a basically a sticky note. What did you hear the parents describe as the branches and leaves and the roots in the soil? And so think about both the, you know, the gaps and uh, challenges as well as the strengths 
and resilience that they that they talked about. Feel free to answer in English or Spanish. You can basically add a note by double clicking anywhere on the screen, and then you just type your answer here. Okay, and then once you click anywhere else on the screen, your your oops, your note gets saved. Okay. And so again, just so that we can have this be a, a bilingual board, just know that once you have posted your notes, that Gisela and Nikki are going to be going back and basically translating um, from English to Spanish or Spanish to English. Um, so you'll see, and they're gonna do that through the comments panel. So just know that you'll see things added to your sticky notes, or if you wanna read what the translations are, you can click on the, um, speech bubble icon to see what it says. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so that it's um, sometimes that makes it confusing to know where you're clicking or what to click on if <laughs> you're looking at my screen and the website. So I'm going to give you just a few minutes, kind of like a popcorn debrief where we just give everybody a few minutes to share whatever is coming to the top of their minds after hearing the conversation among the parents. What did you hear the parents describe that the branches and leaves and the roots and the soil? And I like how um, someone is uh, typing right now, it said branches, mental health, family trauma. So that's great to actually you know, tie it to whether it's the branches or the leaves or the soil. I'm seeing access to culturally appropriate services and translation. Yeah, and then someone else has figured out that if you click on the heart, it's basically like saying that you agree with it, it resonates with you. So feel free to do that as well as you start to see more of these notes appear. The soil, I'm seeing someone put access to healthcare and specialty care. Just as people are thinking about and, and posting some reflections here, um, I just want to say that you know one of the things that I really appreciated and that really I think um, that I felt you know in the conversation was, was just both the positive things that that you all said you know things that are working well that are helpful and then just being willing to be very real and vulnerable and open about the things that are struggles um, you know, in terms of accessing services or you know, your own um, you know, mental health, in terms of depression or anxiety. It's, it takes a lot of courage to actually say that out loud to a whole bunch of strangers <laughs> on a screen like this. Um, and yet those are the kinds of conversations right, that we need to be able to have, not only in these comfortable welcome spaces like this, but in those spaces where people may not be so interested in hearing it or open to hearing it and, and think about how do we use our kind of collective leadership and power to be able to make those voices heard and make those messages heard. So just wanna thank all of you for, again, that level of honesty and sharing. Okay, so I'm starting to see more things appear here. To soil, quick access to resources and services in different languages. Someone else saying the amount of courage is amazing. Yeah, it's taking the time to be human while talking about these issues. Very important as clinicians. Yeah. Someone else, um, let's see. Need for more parent spaces and leadership opportunities. Yep. So how do we do more of this is really the question for us to be thinking about. Okay, I'm going to keep that padlet up. Feel free to keep adding to it. But I do want to switch over now to tell you what we're going to do um, during the breakout groups because we want to have an opportunity um, 
for you all to, again, kind of go to the next level, go a little bit deeper in these conversations. And so in the breakouts, and we'll tell you how we're going to divide you up in just a moment, but we're going to have about 20, 25 minutes um, for you to, to get together in smaller groups of about four to five people in each group. Um, when you get to your group, we're going to ask you to pick a facilitator. So someone who can just help guide the conversation and make sure that you're kind of um, giving everybody a chance to contribute and be part of the conversation. Uh, we have three questions here that we're going to suggest that you discuss. Um, and so build off of everything you just heard in that parent conversation build off of these reflections that you're posting or that you're seeing on the Padlet. Think about what the parents shared and think about what sounded familiar. So which of those things have either happened to you also, or you see them and recognize them as things that happen in your agencies, either, you know, it could be unintentionally, could be by design, um, but think about, you know, so this is now our turn <laughs> to be really courageous and honest about which of that sounds familiar, which of these things are what might we be doing um, is the first question. And then how do we embody the values the parents talked about? How do we, so uh, especially some of the requests that they had or they suggested at the end, like how do we really do that? Um, and then finally, and, and this is really where we wanna make sure that you get a chance to um, talk about this in your discussions. This is the call to action. How will you and your group or organization that you're part of center community voice and leadership as we all work together to design our ACEs informed network of care. Okay, so we still have people returning. As we're waiting for everybody to make it back here, I'm actually going to launch a poll and it's a bilingual poll with the Spanish first, but we wanted to just get a sense of kind of what has come up for you or, or you know, what new idea, whether you have new ideas, where you think you might go from here after today's session. We want to know whether today's session and particularly the parent conversation has given you new ideas and insights about how to center community voice and leadership. And how likely are you to have conversations with parents and caregivers like the one you heard today? And I'll just leave this up for a moment as people are rejoining this meeting. And just know that you have to answer both questions before you can submit your answers. And um, so I'll just leave it up there for a moment. And I know that the breakout discussions were short. I know that there were some. Um, issues there in terms of everyone getting to a room, partly because I posted the wrong link in the beginning. I'm so sorry about that. Um, and then also uh, not everyone was getting automatically sent to a room. And so there was quite a bit of time spent just trying to move people around. But hopefully those of you that made it to a room were able to have uh, some good discussion. And it ended and Allison are going to lead a little debrief about what came up in those discussions in just a moment. So again, for those of you that are just, that are just coming back, um, hopefully you see a poll with two questions that you can answer. We're asking, have you gained new ideas and insights today about how to center community voice and leadership and how likely are you to have conversations with parents and caregivers like the one you heard today? I'll give it just another like 10 seconds or so before I close the poll and turn it over to Allison and, and, and Anita. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll. And we'll just quickly take a look at a lot of yeses, very likely. So that's great news. And definitely we will make this an ongoing conversation. Hey, Allison and, and, and it ends yeah. up, you want to go ahead and take it from here to lead us through a little debrief? Sounds great. Thanks, Nicole. Um, so let's reflect. And I know we're still, some of us didn't get a full chance to have the small group conversation. So let's use the chat to also share our thoughts. I invite you all. You can um, chat in whatever language you like and it'll be translated. So we really want to focus our debrief on this call to action. 
you know, how will you center community voice and leadership in designing your ACEs informed network of care? So um, I'm going to invite folks to, you know, un raise your hand and, and then you can unmute yourself to share. If you're on the phone, you can press star nine to unmute yourself um, or to raise your hand, I think. Um, and, you know, we'd like to hear from as many people as possible over the next 10 minutes or so to please try to keep your comments brief. Um, and I would like to start with uh, folks on our Spanish uh, language channel to share um, your, your insights around that call to action. And I want to begin with Diana because I know that she had kind of a, a, a final comment that she wanted to make at the beginning. So Diana, maybe you can just kind of uh, share what was on your mind and help lead us into this conversation around how we center community voice and leadership in our systems. Um, sí, yo solamente quería cerrar con broche de oro, como se dice. Yes, I wanted to close by saying that I wanted to say these words. We are the leaders uh, for today, and we are creating the future leader leaders with hopes and dreams, with rich uh, hearts full of love and humility, and with a desire to meet all of their professional goals to the maximum capacity so that they can resolve the challenges that are in front of them and raise their voice the same way that we are raising our voice and that they can become leaders uh, to help our community. We want uh, men, empowered men and women. And why not? The new presidents remembered our dreams have no limits and they will never have them. <laughs> Thank you, Diana. Uh, very motivating words. Uh, we really thank you for these words uh, from the bottom of our heart. And I hope that that motivates some of you to share about what are some of the actions that you're going to take to incorporate uh, community voices uh, to our work. If somebody wants to share in Spanish, uh, we can do, we're going to do that first. Those of you Spanish speakers can go first. I don't see any hands uh, raised. Bueno, yo quiero compartir que esta parte de ACE que estamos haciendo, uh, this, this una part de las about cosas ACE que a mí me está that we're working on is something that I'm really enjoying and I'm, es que I'm, I'm motivated because ACE wants us to do follow up when, when we find que los that children are having a hard time or a developmental de, uh, delay. So this gives me hope that we're going to take action. And one of the actions that one of the women in our group was exposing is that it's, we, we don't just talk about this, but that we actually as community take action. And that we follow up up on each case, I have the hope estos, um, that with this, de ACE, no nos that ACE can serve as a mil niños con impulse, en el de Santa and that we Cruz, know no that if we have so many kids, for example, with autism papá, in, in, in Santa Cruz County, that we're not going to do anything about it. We're just going to live it up to mom and dad, and no, that shouldn't be that, that case. We need to do something about it. Like, what products are being sold in the community? Do they need to be, be better quality y with more nutrients? Hacer, um, there's a lot to do. Um, but I, este, I think si that de la if, mano, we, if, we, a a los padres, if we work paso together paso, so that we can teach parents step by step as a community, we can make a big difference um, versus just putting that responsibility on the parents and that they have to figure things out on their own, how Porque they have to de, uh, work with their kids. Because uh, we talk about no uh, healing uh, or uh, healing no from trauma, but no the trauma doesn't heal con la when we are ahí, no, no with, when we're no, they're supporting paso, people, holding holding them by their hand, um, walking with them step by step, requiere. and when we don't give them the, the, the treatment that they deserve. Thank you, Laura. Anybody else who would like to share English or Spanish? How, how do we um, 
how do we use these voices, the parents' voices? And I just want to please ask everybody to remember to choose a language channel, either English or Spanish. So we just hear the interpreter or you speaking and not both. Thank you. Hi, um, I'll go for our group. My name is Elaine. Um, Jose and Gabri um, Gabriella I believe, uh, and Allison was in our group. Um, I think the thing that we walked away with is being willing to see, being willing to see the parents coming in to Head Start and um, being accessible to them. Um, uh, I'm committed as I build the community that resource that we're going to be having in Santa Cruz that, um, you know, we see the people that come to us in their vulnerability and, you know, have solutions to the best of our ability. But even if we don't have solutions, that we come as open-hearted as possible and, um, and compassionately, human to human. Um, I think that that's the best way that uh, we can move forward. Um, yeah, yeah. Am I missing anything? I think that's it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, looks like Najib has his hand up. Yeah, um, thank you for the opportunity. And it's been an amazing um, experience listening to our parent leaders um, give us really great insight and input. I think, um, you know, for us, it's really about in our group talking about how do we get culturally appropriate services uh, throughout um, the county and specifically a focus on translation services. Um, and I think the commitment out of all of the discussion that we had was that we're gonna be more consistent within the work that we all do as individuals in our agencies to getting input from community in the details and the planning of what we're working on. You know, not like, you know, getting some kind of broad ideas, but really being involved in the planning part of, of the work that we're all doing. Okay. That's great. Thank you, Najib. Yep. Can you share a little bit, please? Yes, please. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the parents that shared. I feel like it was so hard to move in and vulnerable and so rich for all of us who do work in the community. I think that represented those of us um, as parents and, and I just love what they help us to see. And uh, what I noticed is that yes, we do carry a lot of um, adverse experiences that we lived and at the same time, I can see the resiliency that come through or that are built through all of the challenges that we faced. And um, I think it doesn't matter what happens to you, but who is there to hold your hand? Are you going through all of these experiences that make up your life? Thank you for all the work that all of you are doing, all of us are doing. Thank you so much. I think we have time for one more person to share. Can I share? Please go ahead, Mercedes. Uh, yes, I, um, you know, in the past year, I feel that um, we as community members and um, parents and family have lived a very traumatic experience. We have seen the parents and our families and children suffer with more traumatic distress um, as uh, what we were talking in our small group with the needs that they have. We need to empower the voices that are very not seen and heard. And these are the least advantaged families that we all work with. 
Um, I work with 100% of the families that have the greatest needs. And unfortunately, I have seen um, more sadness um, and greater issues with their mental health with our families. And um, they are in such despair that it is really even hard trying to make a plan, a list of where to start to have them regain their strength, their confidence, and their um, you know knowledge about where to go for support. Our community needs to have like a lot of the um, uh, this the speakers mentioned uh, Spanish bilingual sites forms that are easy to read when they go to the clinics, signs that are posted outside that are very visible and clear in both or, you know, more languages, because we don't only have two languages that are spoken in the community. We have many languages. And I think the cities really need to look into what languages are spoken in our community, what groups, are we including in our communities? We're not including many groups. And so family within family, we have different languages. We just don't have one language. And so our families are even more secluded now, more than ever. And I think that that's where we begin a new beginning of how to bring the trust back with their families mm -hmm. to start over again. Thank you. Thank you, Mercedes. Really appreciate hearing that. And, um, you know, I think that I'm so grateful for all of you and for our parent leaders to help us see more and to really feel more so that we can act. Um, but we really do need to begin with that pause and that listening process. And this was a really powerful session to help us practice that and strengthen our systems. And it doesn't just happen because we say it's gonna, we wanna do it. It takes an investment of time and energy and resources to be intentional about how we do inclusion, like Mercedes is saying. And so I'm so grateful that we have such a strong committee, uh, community um, committed to that kind of systems change. So I want to thank you all. I'm, I'm going to pass it to Erindira to say a few comments and then back to Nicole to wrap us up. Thank you, Allison. I think you touched on everything that I was going to say, but what I mainly want to say is that we do have a challenge and it's a good challenge because it's to create something better for our community. And the good thing about this challenge, like the, like the moms told us, is that we have strength that can help us to overcome these challenges. Just like they told us, uh, we have strengths and we all want these moms and all the moms, all the families in our community uh, reach for their goals, that they, that they accomplish their goals, their hopes. What I want to tell you is to make sure that you don't forget their words. They were here. Um, and I, and I ask you to take what they shared today, take it with you in your, in your heart and also implement it on the spaces that you're part of. So how are you gonna incl incl include the parents? How are you gonna include the community? Not just when you're gonna provide the service, but as you are developing the service, when you are thinking what, you're, what, what you are about to offer. So I ask you to commit to them. And I, uh, I think, I thank you for being here and for creating this space uh, to share this knowledge that is in our community. Thank you. I just, I know we've got just a couple of minutes left here, maybe just one minute left. <laughs> and I, again, just want to send a huge thank you to Allison and Edenida for your partnership today in planning this session and doing such a beautiful job of crafting the questions and guiding the conversation and, and, um, and inviting these amazing parent leaders to share their stories. I, I hope you all can tell how much it meant to everyone participating today and, and how meaningful it was. And you know, my um, kind of challenge and request to everyone who's still on this call is let's keep this going. Like, so we have our next ACEs Aware session on April 8th. 
uh, and our theme is building and strengthening network connections. Uh, we don't have the registration link yet because we're still planning that session, but we will be going back and thinking about how do we build on the conversations that happened today? How do we really turn um, you know, our call to action into action? And so we will be reaching out soon with information about how to sign up for that April 8th session and hope that you all join us and bring more uh, of your families and coworkers and colleagues to these conversations because we've already seen in the last several months how, the, how these sessions keep growing in terms of who's participating and contributing um, to this conversation. So we encourage all of you to help us uh, continue doing that. And so our very last thing that we're gonna ask you for today is um, there'll be a, a link in the chat in just a moment um, to share your feedback about today's session. Again, you can either answer the survey in English or in Spanish. Um, if you have a camera handy and you wanna scan the code to open up the survey and answer it that way, you can do that as well. But we would really like to have your feedback about today's session because we do learn from those and, and use the feedback to help us plan future sessions. So again, save the date for the April 8th session. Registration will be opening soon. And the recordings and slides and all of that will be available next week after we've had a chance to compile all of this. And I think that is it for today. Again, we um, just wanna thank you for being here and participating in this session. Allison and Irenira, if you want to post your contact information in the chat, uh, feel free to do that because I'm sure there are others who would love to stay in contact with you as well. And with that, we will say, a, we'll, usually we do our big group hello. This time we'll do our group goodbye as everyone goes their separate ways. So thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Viviana and Yvette, Diana, Luzeth. This was amazing. Appreciate all the good work y'all doing. Looking Thank forward you. to com com camaraderie. <laughs>